he is he is just like your your uncle, except somehow some way he you know he comes out of that fog. I'm not sure how he does this, and must have come back to Baltimore to his father. Well, his father's dead, but he must have come back to his mother, um, and and said. I need help. So he must have got to that point where you, you go, I need help. And that, and in those days, that must have been the only place you could go was up to Toronto. That was Joe Brooks telling the story about the elder Joe Brooks coming off the streets and getting away from alcoholism to change fly fishing forever. This is episode number 71 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Today's episode is sponsored by the Wet Fly Swing Member Society. The Member Society provides exclusive discounts and access to innovative products and services from our member partner companies. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to check out some of the companies who are on board. Plus, you can support the show at one convenient location. In today's episode, I talk with Joe Brooks, the great nephew of the man who influenced many great fly fishermen, including Lefty Cray and Flip Pallet. We talk about how Joe was the first one to put saltwater fly fishing on the map how he came to host one of the greatest outdoor shows of all time, and his connection to Babe Ruth. We also hear a story about how he was Mr. Montana, how Patagonia fishing started, and how Joe bowled a perfect game along with winning golf tournaments and pretty much playing pro baseball. Don't miss this one. Is Joe? Uh, we hear how Joe pulled himself out of alcoholism off the street to live a life uh, giving back to uh, fishing and kids around the world. So, without further ado, here's Joe Brooks. How's it going, Joe? It's going really well. Good, good. Everything's, uh, everything's good here. It's, uh, it's good to have you on. We've, uh, we've got quite a bit to talk about here. There's, uh, I can't remember where exactly I first heard about you. I mean, obviously, Joe Brooks, you're, you're, not the, uh, you're not the real, well, you are the real Joe Brooks, but you're not probably <laughs> the people that, you know, the person that most people know of when they hear Joe Brooks. But we'll get into all that. I, I did want to, um, you know, before we get going here, maybe just talk a little bit about your background and, and talk about your relation to actually Joe Brooks, the, the person who was, uh, I guess, an iconic figure in fly fishing back in the day, and then talk about how the, the documentary came to be. Okay. Uh, well, firstly, um, so I'm one of eight children. And um, so Joe Brooks, the, the fisherman, was uh, my grandfather's uh, brother. And his, his dad was Joe Brooks Sr. So I'm probably the, the third one. But um, Joe Brooks Sr. had uh, two wives. His first wife died in childbirth, and then he remarried, and he had two more children. And that was uh, Joe Brooks Jr. and then my granddad, and those two, the two brothers, to the second wife were very, very close. So uh, Uncle Joe, as we referred to him, was um, very close with my dad. And so I, like I said, I'm from a big family, and I'm number seven of eight kids, six boys. They must have struggled for a name when I came around, and uh, so they, uh, they. Uh, Named me after uh, Uncle Joe and, and after uh, my great grandfather, so that's how I became or I got named uh, huh. Joe Joe Brooks. Yeah, gotcha. so that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And then, what, what's your first um, memory of um, you know fly fishing or and or and, and Joe Brooks and your uh, and re- remind me again he he was your um, I guess your bro- your dad's brother or my dad's uncle. Your, your so dad's he's uncle. a great uncle. Great uncle. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Great uncle. Gotcha. Yeah. But in his words, I like it. I don't know if he says in the documentary or not, but in various conversations we had, he said he was like a second father to him. So it's sort of like, you know, everybody has that uncle or, well, he was an uncle, I guess, but they have that significant other in their life. Well, that was uh, Uncle Joe to my dad. Um, yeah, so that's, so they were quite close. You know, he, he'd be coming in from out of town and he'd, uh, He'd rock up at uh, my grand my grandparents' place, and uh, and say to my granddad's wife, "I'm taking uh, little Ray, little Ray, young Ray, young Ray out fishing. We'll be back just before dark." 
And then, you know, he'd grab them and off they go. And so my father would relay that story that that would happen quite often whenever uh, he and Mary were in town, they'd be banging their off. So that, that's kind of cool. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, so, I mean, we're going to talk um, a lot about the documentary that, that you've put together about, you know, Joe's life and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you can talk about a little bit up front for those who don't know Joe. You know, I know there's a good chunk of my audience that they're kind of a little bit younger. So can you tell mm-hmm. us why, why Joe Brooks was significant and in what era we're talking about here? I mean, well, to, fly, f- about, to fly fishing yeah. and specifically. Yep. So he was born in 1901. So he came, I guess, to the fore in the world of fly fishing through his writing, probably in the late 40s when he wrote his first book, Bass Bug uh, Fishing, which was basically fly fishing for bass, which was the first book ever written and dedicated to fly fishing for bass. (laughs) Everybody's writing about trout. He pivots and writes about bass. And so the bass that he were catching weren't necessarily the bass on ponds or lakes, but these were the brackish uh, black bass of the Chesapeake Bay, or at least the tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay. And these, they're catching these really big fish. And so he's, he's writing about it. He's in his first book in 1948. And that gets him going. I wouldn't say that was any catalyst for his career. And he was writing an article uh, called Pools and Riffles, for a small paper in um, in Towson, Maryland at, at the time. But that, that book got him going. It wasn't a huge catalyst, but it got it going. And slowly he started, I guess, building uh, a following in Maryland at least, and, and that started to spread, and he, he wrote more books. But he's probably, in the world of fly fishing, he probably had the biggest impact in saltwater fly fishing. And he wrote the very first book on how to basically uh, fly fish in salt water. And that was 1950. It might have been. I mean, I've got it on my bookshelf. Yeah, I can go grab sure. It. No, I that's fine. The date, but it's the very first book ever written and dedicated to fly fishing in salt water. Gotcha. And that, that was early 1950s. Let's say that. Okay. And, and so he, he then begins to – tell people how to, you know, the, the, the rivers are fabulous, but man, there's so much bigger fish and exciting fish out in the ocean, you know? And so he's, he's beginning to teach everybody how to catch fish in salt water. And it, and it started back for him because he was, he was a trout man from the beginning. He, he covers that in, um, in, uh, his, his book called fly fishing. Uh And, um, he talks about when he started out, you know, he was, you know, a dry fly purist from the beginning. And, and he, um, he learned to catch these bass, which I mentioned before by this guy by the name of Tom Loving in the, in the early twenties when he was a young man. And so that's where, and then he moved into the Chesapeake Bay going after stripers with Tom and Shad. Right. And so now he's exploring saltwater catching, you know, much bigger fish than you would find in your freshwater in most of the water on the East coast, because nobody was fishing, uh, in the West huh. at, in those days, um, in the, in the salt water. So, so he slowly, slowly started to unlock the keys or unlock or, you know, use the various keys that he was learning to unlock how to catch fish in the salt water. He's writing about it and telling everybody and slowly there's a bigger following. Then you have lots of guys coming after him, you know, that, are today the the icons of the sport Mm -hmm. and lefty craze certainly would have been one of the big, big, big names and followers of, uh, of Joe Brooks. So was he doing fly fishing exclusively or was he doing a little bit of everything for the saltwater? He, well, his, his love of course is fly fishing, but he would, you know, he'd use anything just about to go fishing. I mean, he was a fisherman at heart. So, you know, in some of those American sportsman shows, uh, from the sixties and early seventies, you can see him catching permit using a live crab. Huh. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I put those up. I put a, I put a sequence up on the Facebook page. So he was a, he was a fisherman at heart. Fly fishing was his passion. And that's what he wrote primarily about. But he also, uh, in another one of his books called, 
I think it's just saltwater fishing or game fishing, saltwater game fishing, I think it is. He talks about various ways, even how to rig uh, a bait for marlin. Hmm. Right. And, and he's not trying to take the credit for all of this. He, in many of his books, he says, look, I've learned all of this from the various guides and various captains and, and first mates and various people that he has been fishing with. So he's always trying to, mm-hmm. to help, to help these guides. Cause it's a hard way to make a living being a guide. And he's always trying to promote them wherever he could at every turn. You know, he's always talking about Dan Bailey. He's always talking about uh, some of these other guys that have been great mates and friends mm-hmm. to him, but also have helped him and, t- and taught him. So he's always trying to use through his writing medium and audience to say, Hey, use these guys. If you're going to do this type of fishing or these guys, if you're in, if you're going to be in Livingston, you're going to be in Montana and you got to look up Dan Bailey type of thing. Yeah. You know, so gotcha. he always gave the credit yeah, back to everybody that was helping him. Could we go through a little bit of maybe just from the beginning in the documentary? Because, I mean, there's some major things in this movie, you know, talking about alcoholism and, mm. uh, I mean, some really heavy stuff that I think people can, um, you know, it's a good story. It, it's an amazing story to talk about where he, where he came from and where he went. And can we just kind of go into a little bit of that? Just take us back to the, the beginning and walk through some of the challenges and how he overcame those and how he became such an iconic figure? Yeah, he... Um... So he grew up in an affluent family in Baltimore, um, and his dad, his dad had a um, an insurance company, well-known insurance company in Baltimore, and his dad was quite philanthropic as well. And Joe grew up pretty much with you know whatever he wanted, I suppose, and he was quite a, a good athlete as well. So as a young man, he was picked up by a, the semi-pro team called the Baltimore Orioles. And the Orioles that are now the pro team, of course, were a semi-pro team in those days. Mm-hmm. And Babe Ruth was actually on the same team, but how many years before? That's six years before. Oh, wow. But, yeah, but Babe was only on the team for a very short amount of time because he was sold to Boston, I believe, if I know this story. Anyway, I uh-huh. think he was sold to Boston by, by the owner. So the owner was, and in and, and those days, uh, Babe Ruth was a, was a pitcher. He was a hurler. Oh, that's right. And that's what, uh, that's what uh, Joe was. He was a pitcher. And he was, so he was picked up by this team. His dad said, nah, 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 this isn't really what I had in line for you. Because, <laughs> you know, baseball in those days clearly is not what it is today. Right. So his dad said that. Nah. So that sort of put squash that ambition but his his father ended up dying when he was about 17 i'm pretty sure he was 17 and then joe goes right i'm going to try and get back into this or get heavily back into this baseball thing he never gets back there must have been about 19 because i think it was two years later but anyway so he gets back into baseball and he's very successful at it and um but he doesn't get back up to that level of being picked up again by the orioles um, as a, as a young man and funny enough, that team, that team that, uh, he was picked up to play with ended up winning the league for the next six years in a row or something like that. So he would, he would have been on a very good team and on a, on a, a good trajectory to make it to the, uh, the big leagues if he had, if he had continued, so anyway, so he, his dad dies, he gets back into baseball and he's traveling around New York with a team and he's pitching the lights out of the place and he's playing, I think, for another team in Baltimore and he's doing the same thing and he's getting a name for himself. But at that time, he moves out of that. He, he, um, he marries his first wife. Uh, her name's Arlene Dickey and she's a socialite of Baltimore and this is the Roaring Twenties and she's having, he's having a grand old time, but that marriage doesn't last too long. And Joe's slowly moving into becoming an alcoholic because of the, the amount of partying I suppose he's doing. He's, you know, she's quite wealthy and he's having a real crack at drinking her inheritance and playing a lot of golf and fishing. And 
and this is the time where he's meeting uh, uh, Tom Loving, who introduces him to to fishing in saltwater. Um, so a lot of these things are sort of just you know flowing in and out of his life, but the the alcohol is really starting to get to him, and uh, he ends up he ends up divorcing, or she divorces him, I imagine. Uh, and he um, he sort of just disappears through the late twenties, as far as we could find the late twenties and early thirties. But what we can find, because of his sporting prowess, he would pop up at different places, playing golf in, in pro tournaments, or boxing, um, or even bowling. You know, or playing playing football. So he's. You know, you can find snippets of him in papers around the country as he's popping up. And I don't know, he maybe was just wandering. I don't, we have no idea exactly how he got where he went or what he was doing. But we could track him down by these snippets of, of newspaper clippings that we that we un, unearthed through this uh, discovery process of trying to find out where the heck he is. Because he, he reemerges in the middle of the 30s. In the 1930s, he reemerges. He comes home. So this is quite, you know, it's a, probably a good 10 years where he almost goes missing. You know, the family has no idea where he is. He's just vanished. But if we if we just pause for a moment and consider the time frame that we're looking at, we're looking at the Depression, right? America does not come out of the Depression, the Great Depression, until the start of the Second World War, which is, for the Americans, you know, 1941, Pearl Harbor. So he's he's emerging out of his gloom in the 19 mid 1930s, and he comes back to Baltimore somehow, some way. He convinces somebody to send him up to this asylum, as they called it, for alcoholics, right, to help them uh, recover from being alcoholics. And I think that was it. Must have been pretty common. Uh, there's a movie out there uh, that probably paints a similar picture, and I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it it talks about the the guy or the lady, not the guy who started Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's from the woman's point of view, but it paints the exact same time frame of what we're talking about here. So anyway, he he goes there. They give him cocktails of drugs to get to dis to associate horrible, horrible things and feelings with alcohol, which is, you know, funny today or funny enough today, that's a, that is almost best practice. You know, that's what they're doing today. A similar, a similar process, probably not the same cocktail of drugs that they're put, that they put into him, but he emerges from that, um, a man who never drinks again. So he, as, as my mother said, she, she, um, she thought he was such a fantastic person to overcome that, to be able to say, right, I'm never going to drink again. And he never did. And I know Lefty told me, uh, at least on one occasion, that Joe said to him that was the greatest thing he'd ever done. So that's, yeah, for somebody who had done, as, as we'll see, you know, or as you see in the documentary, somebody who had such a major impact on this thing called fly fishing. Yeah. Right? That was his biggest achievement was overcoming that deep, deep hole. Yeah. So he, he emerges from there, a new man, a man on a mission, and he doesn't want to be that terrible person that he was because as an alcoholic, and I mentioned before, he was quite a, a good boxer. As an alcoholic, it's a nasty combination to be a good fighter and then have a bad temper <laughs> and not be in control of yourself because of alcohol. So, you know, one of the stories goes when he walked into a, um, when he walked into a, uh, into a bar, you know, people took note, like they stood up and, you know, they took note who was coming in because they did not want to have a piece of him. Right. Because he, he was a big dude, you know, he weighed 200 pounds, he was all muscle. Yeah. You know, he wasn't somebody you wanted to tangle with. Yeah, and he wasn't fat, he was just a solid, solid. As a matter of fact, my son, my second son, is a similar build, just this big square sort of trunk of a person, you know? Just yeah. these big, broad shoulders, very square. 
so anyway, so he emerges um, from this, to, and he, he, you know, he, he just basically never drinks again. Though you could drink with him, like he never had an issue if somebody was drinking with him. He, there was never, there was never any like judging or anything like that. It was just for him. He just knew he could never, he could never drink again. So he ends up marrying another gal somewhere along the line. We we tracked her down, but there's not enough information around that particular marriage. But that doesn't last very long. And now we're up to. When he returns, he gets involved in the Maryland State Game and Fish Association as a volunteer, just trying to – he must have come back. I, I, we don't know. We, yeah, everybody's dead, so you can't talk to anybody. And what year was but that? What year was that? that well, he returns, I think – because we, we say basically he started his life when he was 35 years old. So the sanatorium – asylum thing that he went up to was in Toronto and he was up there. I don't know how long he was up there actually, but he was up there for whatever amount of time it took for him to graduate from their program. So he graduates, comes back to Baltimore and he's basically 35, 36 years old. So that's when he starts his life essentially. But yeah, you noted, I mean, the alcoholism thing. And you also noted the, the sports. So did you say he was, he played pro sports or went into pro tournaments and bowling? I mean, multiple things. Go- that just sounds really amazing, I guess, nowadays when you think of a player that could go do four different pro sports. Yeah, he didn't, not the, not the pro bowling, but people have seen him bowl perfect, uh, perfect uh, <laughs> games. Like I remember this guy sent me an email or something saying, yeah, my father sold Joe Bowl a perfect game, which I believe is 300. Yep. Um, in like Waynesboro or, or Boonesboro, one of those places in like West Virginia or Virginia or North, somewhere around there. And, um, and I'd heard that story, but you know, you're not sure what's a myth and what's a fact, but yeah, the guy goes, yeah, no, my dad said, yeah, he saw him bowl this perfect game. Hmm. So he was, he was just, he was just a really good athlete. Like, yeah. Whatever he picked up, he seemed to do really, really well at it. But yes, he did play professional um, golf, and and he did shoot. and And this is up out west somewhere, and I think he sh- he played some around Maryland as well. But he did shoot the course record in Maryland at a at a country club called um, well, it's called Baltimore Golf and Country Club. It, I think it was called. Anyways, they have one of their courses is called Five Farms, and I believe that's where he did it. I um, mean, it was a 65, which, man. <laughs> wow. 65 is pretty darn good for somebody yep. who picked it up in his early 20s. So he didn't grow up playing golf. No, that's crazy. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gives you an idea about his athleticism. Yeah. Okay. So so basically, yeah, so the mid-30s, he reemerges and he – comes yep. out of the this period where he is just basically in the gutter, kind of nobody hears from him, and and I mean obviously that would be a reawakening right there, just having that part of your life, and and so now painted the picture like what, what it looks like now that he's he's getting involved in the kind of the fishing game, you know why why did all that? I guess he had fishing in his life. He just he started to want to make a difference to for other people. Yeah, that sounds that sounds pretty spot on. I think he must have come back. And again, a lot of this is is us just trying to connect dots. We're not exactly sure, but fishing, yeah. And you know, you went, we went through all his books to see if he'd, if he'd give us a clue here or give us a clue there, which he did from time to time. So we know that he was fishing as a as at least a teenager. We knew he met Tom Loving in the twenties, so fishing was a part of his life from a young age. So he must have come back and said, "Hey, this is what I love." I know I want to stay far away from the alcohol, and and he was fishing through his his alcoholism. So we the the out of doors must have given him some solace. So he must have said, I, you know, this is where I need to be to to stay away from the alcohol. And so, and then and then he must have felt like he wasted so much of his life, and probably was so detrimental to so many people that that he said, right, I want to get back. I don't want to, I don't want to hurt people anymore. I want to give to people. And so he spent the rest of his life giving as much as he could. And he did that through his writing. So if you see, if you read his works, he's teaching you how to catch 
fish, what to use, where to go, who to talk to, uh, how to read your line, how to mm-hmm. how to create your own you know perfect taper or tapered leader so that it's going to roll over beautifully. And if you don't do it this way, it won't roll over beautifully. And he just mm-hmm. teaches you how to catch fish and all kinds of fish, not just trout, but but salmon or or bonefish or permit or you know you name it. And mm-hmm. He's he's trying to help you as the reader and guide you as the reader. So in those days. A lot of the fishing was, or, or writing about fishing, uh, wasn't so much the how-to, but it was just, it was more of, egal- not, not egalitarian, but more, uh, I guess it was, I suppose. They weren't writing, they weren't teaching people, they were just saying how, you know, what they were doing and, and, um, and not necessarily how they were doing it. So he's trying to democratize fly fishing, to make it. Uh, accessible for the masses and not the elites of New York or, or, or Massachusetts or, or Maryland or Pennsylvania. And, you know, in those days it was East coast. That was it because people didn't know about, about Montana in those days. As a matter of fact, you asked, you know, some of the things that he had done, he helped put Montana on the map because nobody knew about Montana. So he goes out there and he starts writing about it, and he started writing about it in the 50s. But nobody had not known about Montana, and so much so that they they gave him the title because of all the work he had done in conservation and tourism for the state of Montana. They gave him the title of Mr. Montana. <laughs> and I mean, that makes sense, too, how getting you know, this out to the masses because he grew up in a privileged kind of a fairly, mm. you know, with money and he had a wife, his first wife or whatever, the second wife that was, had lots of money. So he knew what that was like. And then he hit the bottom comes, mm. comes up but now he's just this normal Joe, <laughs> normal, mm. normal Joe. And, uh, and he wants to give back. And it, are, is there anything we're missing there on this whole giving back? Because I mean, he did a lot, uh, a lot. Do you, do you think we missed anything along the way or is that pretty much it? How he, how he got into it? Well, he he does hit rock bottom just if we back up a little bit. But there's um, in the documentary, it comes out. But a, a fellow who must have known him, who was a writer on the Delaware Gazette or whatever the paper's called, I can't remember. He must have known Joe, and he he uses a pseudonym for Joe, and he talks about this guy who is panhandling, just to show you the depth that he went to. Panhandling, panhandling, you know, for money, wearing tattered clothes, only so that he can go and take it to go get another drink. But that shows you he had gone from the extreme, right? So he'd gone from this privileged life to being somebody that we would walk past on the street. You know, that disheveled, as we would call a bum, right? That disheveled person on the street corner. Everything, holes in their clothes, long, grotty hair, beard, and you would turn away because they just, they did not look good. They did not smell good. You know, all the various emotions that you can conjure up about that sort of thing. That was him. You know, maybe don't have the extremes, but they can, they can relate to some of this. I mean, especially alcoholism. I mean, I, myself, my dad, went through Mm -hmm. some bouts of, you know, basically his whole life. I mean, alcoholism, I mean, he was kind of a good alcoholic, but you know, it it was a big impact on the family, you know, at the same Mm -hmm. time, it's kind of crazy because, you know, my dad was this amazing athlete as well. And and he just, (laughs) he just turned 80. So maybe there's something to do with, um, I don't know, maybe it's because there were a few, fewer people, but yeah, he was like a three sport kind of semi pro sort of thing. But yeah. And then, and then the panhandling thing, I mean, for me, I actually have an uncle that is pretty much on the streets and, uh, you know, the family is kind of, you know, what do you do? You know, you kind of, yeah. you kind of give up because you, you can't go out there and just grab them off the streets and be like, smack them around and say, get out of it, you know, snap into it. But so I don't know. I mean, I think for me, you know, this sort of story is really powerful because it just shows everybody that, that mm. you can, you can be there and you can come back and then be where Joe took it to, to this amazing yeah. level. Yeah, so he comes back like just like he is. He is just like your your uncle, except somehow, some way, he you know he comes out of that fog. I'm not sure how he does this, and must have come back to Baltimore to his father. Well, his father's dead, but he must have come back to his mother, um, and and said, "I need help." So he must have got to that point where you you go, "I need help," 
And that, and in those days, that must have been the only place you could go was up to Toronto. So I don't, you know, you know, I don't think AA was around, and if it, if it was, then it was early days, you know. But yeah, so somehow he gets there. But but you're right. So so he then does this. So he's clearly this guy that's all or nothing, right? <laughs> Like if I'm doing something, I'm going to do it hundred percent. I ain't doing this half ass stuff. Right. You know, if I'm going to play baseball, I'm going to be the best at it. Or if I'm going to be bowling or whatever it is, I'm going to work hard to be the best at it. And if I'm going to be a drunk, I'm going to be the <laughs> the worst drunk. Right. Or if I'm going to be a fisherman, I'm going to be the best fisherman. Or Not that that was his attitude, but I think that's probably the way he was wired. Like just to try and be the best he could. And so he, he emerges and immediately he's volunteering with the Maryland state game and fish authority or association authority. I think it was, and he meets other people and they start this thing, which is still going today, which you know, you were asking about how he gave back. And one of them is through this thing called the brotherhood of the jungle cock. And so, and he'd also, he'd also at this time had be started writing and, and he must, I think this is when he was writing also that small, uh, that small uh, article for pool called pools and riffles in that thousand time, thousand times, maybe the publication or whatever. Anyway, so he's also beginning to get involved in the outdoor writers association of America. Um, so he, they organize this fishing trip every year to go fishing out in uh, the Western part of Maryland, up in the Cacocton mountains. And they're, they get snowed in one year. And this is May, I believe. Yeah, May. And so these guys that he was fishing with, so it's just some local guys that he was involved, that were working with him or he was involved with in the Maryland State Game and Fish uh, Authority. Uh, they say, hey, why don't we start something? Because he was writing a small publication, too, for uh, boys in fishing. Not necessarily fly fishing, but just fishing. And so they, want, they, they said, well, why don't we start this? association or, or this thing to get boys fishing, but not just fishing, but learning stewardship, right? How to look after the environment because we know this is a finite resource. So let's, let's get, let's teach the next generation how to conserve this and not kill everything. So not, nobody has any fish to catch in you know 30 years. And so they begin this, this, uh, this thing called the brotherhood of the jungle cock. And they invite, you know, as he, as he got involved in the outdoor writers association, they invite a lot of these these big name writers of the day. They all come and they get involved and it flourishes and grows and, and moves out. And there's chapters in New York and Pennsylvania and Michigan, I believe, and various other uh, states. But what it is, the, the whole premise is, is to take a boy and maybe even take a girl nowadays, take a boy fishing. And so that's what you had to do in order to come. And be a part of the association one you had to sign up and I think it's like 25 bucks a year or whatever and um, and what it is is over a period of a weekend it's a it's a basically it's a course for for young boys and girls I suppose um, to learn fly tying rod building stream craft um, and various other aspects of what we all know and love about fly fishing and that happens over year after year after year. And I think they graduate after turning 17 and have done so many of these courses over the years. And that was started back in 1941, I think, or something like that, right around, right around the war. Yeah. And it's still going to, uh, going to, to today. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's, that's something that was big. And I know, uh, that was, one of his loves was the brotherhood of the, the jungle cock. And he never, I think he missed one in all the years that it was going up until his death. I think he only missed one. So wherever he was, whatever he was doing, he made sure his calendar was clear for that weekend in May. Cause always this, it was roughly always the same weekend in May. Mm, okay. And That's the third weekend. And then, so this is the, that started in the early forties. So, so between there and then when did, um, American sportsmen, what happened between the early forties and when American sportsmen started now, was that the next big, uh, was that one of the biggest things he ever did? Yeah, that was, that really, that really, cause that was the beginning really of outdoor television. Essentially that was, that was the absolute yeah. genesis of 
of eyeballs on. <laughs> yeah, and didn't he? Didn't he meet uh, uh, his wife in some involved somewhere along the outdoor writing piece? He did. So he he meets Mary. So so he's he's writing for this paper in, in Maryland, and he's getting this following, and he's joining the Outdoor Writers Association of America, and he goes. He, he saves his money to go to the conference down in Florida, and this is where he meets Mary, and this is after the war. So this is 1947 or 8, somewhere in there, and Mary is head of tourism for the province of Ontario. And what they would do after the war uh, is they wanted the, – the tourism boards wanted to get writers, outdoor writers up there so that they could write about the wonders of, in this instance, Ontario. They'd go back to America where all the people were, right? All the returning servicemen who, in those days, America is, <laughs> you know, like 80% agricultural, you know? All these, fa- all these farm boys returning who love the outdoors, these guys are all writing about fishing and hunting in, in, uh, in Ontario. And it gets people up there, right? So... It's just modern day social uh, social marketing, <laughs> and so and so Joe wasn't Joe wasn't asked to be on the tour, but that's where he met her. Okay, and Joe's Joe got signed up to go on this Alaska tour, so he went up to Alaska, and somebody pulls out of the tour that Mary was putting together, and there must have been a little flame or something was lit when they met because she sends a telegram, and we have the telegram saying. Um, you know, you were invited to join. <laughs> and, and yeah, that's how, that's how that begins. It is her sending him this telegram and she basically his, his tour for the next two weeks on, on her own tour up in Ontario. And that's the next year they're, they're married at, uh, at Jimmy Albright's house in, um, in Florida because he then takes up the, the role as head of, uh, the Met, the South Florida, Miami Herald uh, fishing fishing tournament, which was which was the biggest. I think it's still running, but it was the biggest fishing tournament in the world in those days. Metropolitan, that's what the Metropolitan South Florida fishing tournament, and he he basically ran that. And he was he had just taken up that post in 1948. Met Mary, um, and I think they married in 48, 49 at Jimmy Albright's house. And um, and they moved to Florida, and I think that's right around when he he catches what is recorded as the first deliberate catching of a two-tailing bonefish. This is the is the story. Alan Corson, who was the editor, outdoor editor of the Miami Herald at the time, basically it was a headline and said, you know, I, I think. I think he and Joe and Jimmy had worked something out that they were going to go out catch it, and it was going to become this big article in the in the outdoor section of the paper. And they did, and that was the, really the. I know bonefish had been caught before, but not deliberately, and this was the first uh, deliberate catching of a bonefish. So Joe, um, so Joe's slowly getting this this following. He's writing his book, so he's written his. You know, in the early fifties, he writes the first uh, book on saltwater fly fishing. Um, He's married Mary in the late 40s. They're living in, in Florida. He's running the, the Metropolitan Fishing Tournament. And he's learning and learning and learning from all of these guys, like Jimmy Albright, like I, I just noted. And is that Albright? Is that the Albright knot? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's him. That's it. That's him. Cool. Yeah, he's, he's, he's in the pantheon of... Uh, South Florida fly fi- or South Florida yeah South Florida fly fishing guides for sure Jimmy Albright would be would be up there um, so they're living there he he is so in 1953 1953 he he by chance is up in New York City Pretty sure 53, 54, might have been 54. Anyway, he's up in New York City meeting with a publisher, and this guy, there's a there's a tackle shop called uh, uh, what's it called? I want to say Field and Stream, but that's not it. It's uh, it's just a tackle shop up in New York City. This guy from Argentina comes in, 
and he starts talking to the guy behind the counter and uh, telling him about, you know, the amazing trout in Argentina. And they're like, you've got to come back. <laughs> so he comes, so they chat. Anyway, Jorge goes away, comes back. And when he comes back, Joe's in the, in the fly shop or in the outdoor shop. And this is basically the beginning of Patagonian fly fishing. Okay, nobody nobody knew about going to Punin uh, or Berlioche or any of these places, uh, San Martin, any of these places in uh, in Pat northern Patagonia to go fly fishing, or even southern uh, Patagonia for that matter. So he meets Jorge in uh, in this outdoor shop in New York City on Lex Lexington Avenue, and uh, they hit it off. The two fishermen hit it off. Joe invites him down to Florida. So Jorge jumps a plane, meets Joe in Miami. Joe picks him up, takes him out bone fishing. And Jorge is on cloud nine. They've never seen anybody throw a line like Joe could or, or, um, or, you know, the various other attributes that he was using. And, uh, so this, this guy's blown away by, by Joe. So he goes back to, uh, Buenos Aires and tells this small group of, of uh, avid fly fishermen about, about Joe. They invite Joe to come and visit them in Buenos Aires and then essentially drive to northern Patagonia. Well, they flew down to uh, Terra del Fuego and then they must have flown back up. Anyway, they went to Patagonia and then they went up to northern Patagonia where everybody goes today. Um, and he's, he ends up catching on this trip, uh, an 18 and a half pound brown trout, which he, he writes about it and he writes about it in, uh, uh, in field and stream. And so he's in his writing, he's, he's got this following now, and now he's writing for outdoor life, field and stream and maybe saltwater fly fishermen or whatever. There was only three or four publications back in those days. And, and he was just writing for them. And he writes about it, uh, Boca Fever, in, uh, in, in Field and Stream from this trip in 1955. So it was January 1955 that he went to, uh, he went down there and write, writes about it. And, you know, as Lefty talks about it in, in the film, he said, look, you know, Joe, one of the main things Joe did that most people don't know about is he traveled the world fishing before anybody. And he's writing about it. There is now industries around fly fishing all around the world because of what he did. He wrote about it. And then you had another migration of outdoor writers following him. And they'd write about it. And you can see how it, it just expands and expands and expands and expands. And people want to go there. They read about it and go, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. And they'll save the money and they'll make this trip of a lifetime. And they're going to – and they'll go to – uh, Northern Patagonia. They'll go to New Zealand. Uh, they'll go to Europe, various places of Europe. They might even go to South Africa and all these other places. You know, he caught the first tiger fish in, in no, no Africa. Kidding. You know, he was, yeah, 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 on a fly. That's they awesome. said it couldn't be done. Yeah, and you can read about it in his books. And so he's doing all this. You know, he dies in 1972. And nobody thought to do this stuff, you know. And so he's paving the way. Uh, for all of these other people, like the Mel Kriegers of the world, to, to follow. Like Mel Krieger's huge in Argentina, but, but Mel didn't go there until he read Joe's work, right? Or, or, or Ernie Schweiber, right? Or all these other guys. You know, Joe paved the way for all of these other fishermen to follow, and then they would write about it, and so on and so forth. So that's what Lefty put down. But not only that, but they created industries, right? So there weren't roads and there weren't guides and there weren't boats and there weren't uh, whatever you needed that is so common today. But it all it all starts back to this guy who had the idea to, to jump a plane in this instance <laughs> to fly to Buenos Aires, you know, in a piston plane in 1955 was not an easy trip, right? <laughs> it's, it's not like. It's not like it is today. You can, you know, you know, if you're in Baltimore today, you'd fly to Miami and then probably Miami straight to Buenos Aires, which is, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward 
when he did it, it was a milk, it was a milk run, right? Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way down to, to Buenos Aires. And then the road, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Northern Patagonia, but the road, it's, you're basically driving through the desert all the way to the Andes from Buenos Aires. And in, in, in those days when Joe was doing it, it was a gravel road. Now, when I say you're driving, it's, it's over 24 hours to get there. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. So can you imagine a gravel road? I don't know exactly where you are, Dave, but you know, imagine the gravel road that you were last on for 24 hours. You could do that for 24 hours. Right. No, you know, so that's cool. Yeah. He's, I mean, it's it was, the extreme. It, it's the extreme. Yeah. He, he was doing it well before. I mean, I just talked to um, Jeff Courier a while back and we talked about yeah. African tiger fish. And I mean, I guess the world's a little different now because he, he told a story mm. about how he, how he got ripped out of the bus he was on by some, some crazy people that were trying to kill the driver. Um, <laughs> you know, but that, that, you know, a different, different day. But the point is, is that he, he said, basically he said, don't even try a trip for tiger fish. It's too, you know, for your, one of your first trips is too dangerous. But I mean, Joe did in 19 fit or whatever that was in their fifties, like, you know, whatever, 30 years before anybody even thought about it. Oh yeah. It's he crazy. did this in the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. You know, that's awesome. So, you know, apartheid, apartheid was still, I don't know if you're, if you yeah. don't know how old you are, but you might yeah. not even remember apartheid. Well, I was born in, apartheid uh, still, Totally. I, I was born in 75. I was born three years after Joe died. So, yeah. But so, uh, so yeah. he's doing this and he's opening up the world to everybody else to, to follow behind as well as creating these industries. Like even in Montana, like we go to America, like, he, you know, they named him Mr. Montana for a reason because he created this industry, uh, this tourism industry called fly fishing, which all of us, fly, you know, everybody flocks to Montana to, to catch trout. Gosh, so so now yeah. so this is kind of mid fifties or so. So between then and he dies in seventy two. Uh, so the, the sportsman. I mean, what else is out there between in, the, in this period be, besides you had the American sportsman that came up and then uh, was that that was kind well, of the pinnacle thing. Well, if I just if I just go back, I I'm so, you know this is typical. I'm so easily <laughs> off off course. It's a story of my life. Man. That's anyway, great. <laughs> um, so. So we go if we just go back. So he meets Jorge, and I, you know, I've already walked through the 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 genesis of Patagonian fly fishing, right? So so in 1963, the first American sportsman show, the pilot is done for it. So Kirk Gowdy has this great idea. Um, all these servicemen have returned from the war, and there's nothing on television for them yet. Yeah, you know, 63 is early days of television, so all the programming is for the wives that are staying home. Uh, there's nothing there for the guy. So he comes up with the idea, we need to have an outdoor show. He wasn't sure how, but he knew it had to be fishing and hunting. And um, Rune Aldridge was the head of programming, I think, in those days. And Rune's like, that's not going to be good enough. We have to have a competition, right? And Rune is the guy that started Monday Night Football. Oh, wow. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he has all these hits under his belt. And the other big hit is... American Sportsman Show, which ran for over 20 years. But the very first pilot involved Joe Brooks and Kurt Gowdy on one team, right? And the other team was these two uh, Argentine fly fishermen. So Joe would have been the only one who knew about Argentina and fly fishing those days. And he was also probably the biggest name in fly fishing in those days. So they they fished against uh, Tito, Tito Hosman and Eric Bornick. So these two Argentines versus these two Americans, and it's a fantastic pilot to watch. And I think they ran the whole thing, and I think it was like an hour and a half they ran, and it was rave reviews. Hmm. And that was, and it was black and white, and that's the you can see some of the bits of it I pulled out and put onto um, the Facebook page. Okay. And you can get to the Facebook page also from the website if people are interested. Okay, just to see. perfect. Yeah, and he's even showing how. It's even showing how to double hole in one of them. It's really cool. Yeah, see those black and white things are so cool. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny because, you know, if we just pause for half a second, you think when he's doing a saltwater fishing, he's using salmon rods, salmon reels, salmon line, right? Because salt they, there was no saltwater gear back then. <laughs> Everything is absolute new. Like they're experimenting everywhere they go, right? But anyway, back to American Sportsman Show. So so they, they, um, they had this tournament. In the dying seconds, it's 
the Argentines are winning by three pounds because I think it was pounds is how you won. And then Joe catches this six pound fish in the dying seconds and they win. I know you couldn't have tailored it any better. You couldn't have written it any better. It was perfect. And um, so the Americans win and it's a great story, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, that, that airs to raving reviews and now begins the American Sportsman Show. And so Joe was from 1963 onwards, he was associated with the show as the, uh, as the fishing expert, I guess. So they must have had a hunting expert, a fishing expert, and whatever. And he was the fishing expert. And there's many, many shows that they did. Um, one in particular, I put a portion up, like I mentioned before, about him catching a permit. And they're with Bill Curtis, I believe, who died last year, I think. He died last year. And there's, um, there's a little clip of Bill, uh, 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 Joe and uh, and Kurt, and he's catching this 35, 36-pound permit. Not on a fly, just spin casting. But anyway, that's the genesis, not only in Patagonia and fly fishing, which you mentioned before that, but also the genesis of the American Sportsman Show. And that's where, that's where his name oh, really got out there. Gotcha. Awesome. When you, when he's on, you know, in those days you had ABC, NBC. <laughs> What else? <laughs> CBS, that's it. So, and you're the only game in town, right? All the guys are watching it. And he's writing in those days. He's he's writing. He he didn't want to be an editor of any of these publications because it would he wouldn't be able to travel and write, mm -hmm. right? So he just wanted to travel and write, and that's what he did. Wow. And so now that everybody's reading everything that he writes, and his name's growing. And in 1968, he's offered the editorial ship I think it was 1968 uh, the editorial ship of uh, outdoor life as the yeah, as the the fishing editor for outdoor life and he takes that up I gotcha and that yeah and then, I, then he's got four years until he dies it was that uh, just uh, natural n natural causes and his death there in 72 yeah yeah I think his early life must have yeah. to him but he he had a heart problem yeah and he had a heart attack fishing. No kidding. There you so, go. That's, that, that's the way you want to go. And that's what he said. He wanted to die on a facing upstream. And that's pretty much how he died in, in Montana, the place that he loved. Gotcha. Yeah. And there's so many, I mean, I didn't touch on a lot of this, but I mean, I think that the, the obvious thing here is he touched, he probably it's like lefty Cray, you know, he, he's passed recently too. And, and you, you, you talk about his influence on fly fishing and, you know, people will say he, he's probably influenced everybody. And, and that's the same thing with Joe. He's probably, everybody today can probably thank Joe for, for kind of where we're at because he's had some impact on it. And also like Lefty says, which most people don't know is all the writers of Lefty's error, not all, I can't say all, but a lot of the writers of Lefty's error, they all looked up to Joe and, and also he, Joe helped them get their careers going. Like Mark Sosen, he figures heavily in the in the documentary, and he talks about how Joe helped him and, and gave him a start. And Charlie Waterman and and um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of these other guys. Charlie Waterman, um, yeah. There's a there's a bunch that Lefty mentions. I'm yeah. struggling here. Yeah, no, he, things, but but he was he was basically saying, you know, not only me, Mark, and all these other guys. They, you know, Joe constantly was helping us you know he'd edit he'd look at our work and he'd you know make marks and whatever and he was just constantly putting us in front of the right people and opening doors and getting our careers going and and he said that's a that's another part of the story that people just don't know because joe wasn't the kind of guy to go around tooting his own horn you know he was happy to be in the background just doing his thing and loving what he was doing you know, you put together this document. I'm not sure if you did it on your own or, or how it all came together. Can you talk about mm -hmm. what, what that was like, like the steps of putting it, making a documentary? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, is there a lot? <laughs> I mean, obviously there's a lot to it, but can you talk a little bit about that and, and how you did it all? Yeah. Um, so my brother, Mike and I, we primarily did it. Um, and we, we did it together. He, we self-funded. So, and, and what's a, came up and what's a typical, I mean, this is probably all over the board, but is there a typical yeah. uh, cost? I mean, what does something like this cost to do a, a good, I mean, I have, you know, it's a, it is a great documentary. It's a great movie. What does something like that cost? Well, so when we started originally, we had a, a 
I guess a producer type of thing. And he said, look, this can be from 30 grand to 300,000 or whatever, depending on how involved you go. Right. So Mike went to Cuba because Joe had an impact in Cuba. Joe, uh, Joe went to South America and, you know, so they wanted to travel to some of the places that he went to and meet and talk to people. So that added a lot of expense. So this, this was over the cost to make it was over a couple hundred thousand. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, significant. Yeah, significant. That's right. So, but, you know, it's a (laughs) labor of love. Yeah, sure. We haven't made anything like it uh, on, you know, yeah. So anyway, so that's how much. It's not cheap. But again, if somebody's wanting to make one, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could take that your, expensive, right? You could take your, uh, tell your cell, your cell phone out and, you know, these days make a, make a movie. Yeah. I'm sure. If you know what you're doing. So, um, this, the process started with the, with the idea of, of making a film and the, and the reason that came about is like you were saying, a lot of your listeners are younger and they have no idea of the history. They just like to fish and they have no idea where it came from or who are some of the 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 pillars of the sport. And so Joe's just one of them. And we thought, well, and and we grew up with his books on the bookshelf, but we never read them. And we never had any idea of how, well, the level of impact that he made. And a lot of the stories we heard around the dinner table, we thought were just myths. And so we thought, wouldn't it be great to unearth and and blow off and dust off his his name a bit and and remind people of, of the significance that he had because he was the right guy at the right time. He's not the only guy at the time, but you know, he was gentle. He was humble. He was a great athlete. He was humbled, right? He was yeah. humbled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, he learned humility. <laughs> so, and he was an adventurer and he was a pioneer. So he was willing to, you know, this guy invites you to Argentina and he says, yes, he doesn't even blink. He goes, yeah, I'm in, you know, where some people might go, Oh, well, you know, I don't know, but no, he was a fisherman and he would travel to the ends of the earth, which he did to fish. And I've got more and tons of stories I could keep telling you that, that that's exactly what he did. And he brought stories to his readers from everywhere, from Northern Lapland in, in, in Norway to the Southern tip of South America, to Africa, to Australia and Tasmania and to New Zealand and over to Ireland wow. and England and Austria and you name it. He was, you know, people in America didn't travel, and he's out there going everywhere, God, meeting him. You know, so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is early. You know, this is still. Piss- there are no jets when he's doing this. Right. It's all piston planes, right? He's just cruising around. So, yeah, yeah, and he's writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. So he has thousands upon thousands of articles in the major publications of the day. So anyway, so. So, so to make that, so we thought, wouldn't it be great to remind people of the influence and impact he had on the sport? And that was really the, the genesis. And we had a start with another director and that failed miserably. And so we, we sort of came back together again. And Mike and I said, do we really want to do this? And so then we said, I guess, yes. Well, we didn't guess yes. We said yes. And so we pushed on again and lefty put us in touch with a, Two guys, one um, Jeff Wayne, who became the the producer who got us organized and, and down the right path, and then Lefty, or I guess Jeff put us in touch with the director. So a lot of this was directed by Lefty as to who to t- contact because of his contacts in television. And so that's really how we marched through all this. And the director wrote a treatment, which was brilliant. And you read the treatment, you go, wow, that sounds like a great story. And and then uh, he goes through and he starts filming all the various pieces that he needs to to tell that story. And that's what he did. And I think he did a really good job. Yeah. What well, what does um, failed miserably? What what does that what does that look like? Uh, it was painful. <laughs> like, like yeah, it was just, just not the right person for the job. Correct. That's exactly right. Yeah. Just not. It was not a good fit. He was a fly fisherman, but he, he had tickets on himself, and yeah, it just yeah. Mike and I just sort of looked at each other and went, "Yeah, this isn't working." Yeah, gotcha. and so you just you know sometimes you got to come to that point is even though you don't want to, and you just pull the pin. And, yeah, can you yeah. Um, can you take us to that moment when 
the I mean the movie's been I don't know if did you have a, like a launch or anything, but when it actually first came out, what, what that all felt like for you? I mean, and how many years did it take to get to that point from start to finish? Start to finish, so from idea and then our false start and then our start again. <laughs> it was probably uh, I want to say so eighteen. So it was launched on the Outdoor Channel on Father's Day weekend last year, twenty eighteen. We probably started five years before that with the initial start. Okay. Okay. And then, yeah. And then in 2018, launches on the on the network. There, what? What? How did that feel like when it finally got out there? <laughs> well, it felt it felt good, but you've been looking at it for a while, so probably, you know, like anything else that you've spent a lot of time investing a lot of time in. Once it finally goes to air, it's not as <laughs> yeah, it's not as big of a, you know, a, a, a blast or a, a, as you thought. Earth, Earth, yeah, yeah, not big, but to have it on television. What what was cool is for my dad and my family, our family. That's what was cool because this was a for my father. This was somebody in his life who was massive. You know that second father, as he called him. So to to basically honor him, you know on this channel for all eyes to see was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, and that's the cool thing for me, you know, even though I never had a connection to Joe or, or you or anybody there, I mean, that's kind of a big part of my show. I'm trying to document the history and, you know, on top of providing tips and things like that, this is a little unique show. Usually I get in a lot more tips and tricks sort of thing for people, but you know, I mean, a part of it for me is document the history. And this is really cool for me to talk to somebody who's had a big influence. And, you know, I've interviewed, um, uh, Flip Pallet was on in episode mm. 70 and you know he's had a connection there to the, the American sportsman so I'm slowly getting around and, and touching base I got Joe Humphreys coming up here in, in a while so so yeah this is just another uh, another little piece of uh, the puzzle for me so no it's 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 awesome for you to do all that work mm. yeah and that's another part of it is just giving I guess giving it back to the fly fishing community this this history piece I suppose you know, flips flips in it as well. He talks about it. You know, Joe's impact, and everybody looked at Joe, and so. And I'd imagine Joe Humphreys would know Joe Brooks too. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. He'd be of that age. What do you think? If you just had to say, you know, Joe's, what what is the biggest influence? If you can kind of narrow down on, on your life, if you could pinpoint something. In in Joe's life, uh, just like just Joe, whether the experience of making the movie or just knowing Joe, um, how has that impacted your life? Is there any anything that you could say how you do things because of him or differently? Or, well, I think everybody in watching the film can get a level of inspiration from it for somebody to have gone so. You know, everybody's life is up and down. Nobody's life is just perfectly stable and normal, right? It's, you know, it goes up and down, and you know, you can throw in curveballs all the time. Well. I think one of the great messages from Joe's life is, is just overcoming, right? Just keep pedaling. Don't stop. Just keep pedaling, keep pedaling, keep pedaling, never give up. And I think that's a great message. Yep. Yep. What do you think is, you know, some advice that you, maybe the best advice you were giving or given or something maybe that Joe received through, throughout his life? Anything ring a bell there? Um, I just think with his life, people didn't give up on him. And I think that's like his family, his family mostly. Yeah. And I think, I think for him, somebody must've paid for him. He must've come home as we touched earlier about when he came home in 35 or whatever. So they didn't give up on him. They must've paid for him to go to this sanatorium to get fixed up. So they clearly didn't give up on him. Surely they probably pushed him out of the business, right? Because he wasn't acting appropriately. But when he came back and said, I need help, then they helped him, right? So they didn't give up on him. I think that's a, you know, something pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's something pretty cool too. And thankfully they didn't because the world of fly fishing is forever thankful. That's right. Yeah, they could have. Uh, yeah, we we might not have ever had this movie here if, if things would have went a little bit different, didn't have the mm. support and things like that. Um, yeah. What's the most common Joe question you get these days? Well... I don't know that I get many questions. It's it's more oh, or they're confused by my name, by name, my name and his name. That's true. That is that is a little funny. Yeah, especially since yeah, you're yeah. not you're not his son. You're, but no, <laughs> no. 
did um you know music um i always i'm trying to ask a little bit on the, the background of music do you have any uh music uh either bands or music you're into or, or what was the music of the time back when joe uh was he a music a big music fan do you did you, did you follow any of that well they listen i'm sure they listen to music i don't know exactly but you know you think of the 20s it would have been big band type of stuff so john yeah johnny dorsey or uh you know those type those type of big bands um yeah, that type of music. But personally, I'm really into the latest Mumford and Son uh, album, Delta. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, cool. I don't know if you're a Mumf- Mumford and Son fan, but no, I've I've heard of them. I'm uh, I'll I'll check oh. it out for sure. Yeah, oh, just saw the con- they were here uh, here in Melbourne. Oh, cool. So I just saw the, just saw the concert in January. It was oh, fabulous. Wow. Nice. I'll, yeah, I'll put a link uh, to a, a video in the show notes. I. That's kind of the fun part of this. I'm adding some of that stuff. <laughs> I had uh, Tom, I was mentioned Tom Rosenbauer was on in the back a while back or, well, I guess, you know, I scheduled these out a little ways, but yeah, he introduced me to a band that I hadn't heard of and they're great. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do, I'll do the same here. Yeah. Mumford and Son Rock. Thinking about, um, you know, the best advice that, um, you know, either you or, you know, Joe that you dug up along the way was, was there anybody that was, I mean, I obviously had mentors. Did you, did anything come up that rings a bell there as far as people that had a bit of impact on directing him? The main one that we found was Tom Loving, who got him into saltwater fly fishing. And, and which, who was Tom? And now, who, Tom Loving, what was his yeah, story? Tom, Tom was a guy from Baltimore, and he was a milliner. And he's credited with the basically tying the first saltwater flies. Oh, okay. Right. So he used to tie this double hook shad fly for shad that would migrate up the Chesapeake. And I don't know how Joe came in contact with them, but they got in contact and gotcha. that's, who, that's who took him to fish for brackish water. Cool. Brackish water. Yeah. Large mouth black bass. Okay. And shad and stripers. Yeah. And are you still, um, do you uh, get pretty excited uh, about fly fishing? Are you still out there doing it pretty pretty hard? And, and uh, how, how have things changed in, since Joe's death uh, up until today, do you think? Oh, the gear. The gear is a massive change. I mean, you can watch him double haul with his bamboo fly rod and the lines he was using are nothing like, you know, you don't have the shooting stuff like you have today. So yeah. everything, the gear Yep. The leap forward in, in technology and all the gear has made casting and shooting with lots of line a lot easier. There, but anything else you have going? Are you going to make another documentary here? What's what's going on for you? No, what we'd like people to do is if you're if you're a fly shop owner or a outdoor shop owner or or you're an organization, run a because we have the Joe Brooks Foundation, okay. and we we'd love people, which is a non for profit uh, organization. So every Every dollar is a tax deduction. But what we'd love people to do is, is you know, it's winter time. Hey, why don't you have a, 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 a Joe Brooks uh, film night, a fundraising film night, right? And so bring your people, you know, bring all your clients back into your fly shop or your organization, your members, and have a Joe Brooks uh, fundraising film night. Show the movie, raise money for the foundation. It's a good thing because all the money that we raise is going to um, non-for-profit uh, outdoor organizations like the Brotherhood of the Jungle Cock or uh, Bonefish Tarpon Trust, that type of thing. So we're just trying to – these are things that Joe loves. So what we're, we're sort of trying to do is, is raise money for the, the areas that he loved and to then give it back using Joe's name again like he did – throughout his life and we're just trying to continue that on through the foundation so we'd love people to run these these evenings with their members or their clients or whatever to to raise funds for the foundation so we can give it back no that's great you know it's all i'll, I'll provide links there to some of that stuff um and where, where so the best place to find you would be joe brooks documentary.com or the I that's guess it all, yeah yeah okay yeah, so there's email links there. You can ask us questions. Um, the Facebook page, you can always messenger us from the Facebook page if you want. Um, but there's links on the on the website to how to run a, a fundraising film night or if you want to just watch the film yourself, right? Just go there, follow the link to our Vimeo uh, page, and you can watch. You know, you could rent it or purchase it, or if you want, you can buy the, C, uh, the CD, the DVD, sorry. We have DVDs for sale if people want to buy that 
but yeah, that's what we're trying to do is just promote. What we're trying to do now is fundraise. So yeah. we just we need as much help as we can in uh, in raising money so that we can give it back. Definitely, been a, you know, it's an amazing story. I think we didn't probably do it just as a, as far as watching the movie. So hopefully, everybody can go out there and take a take a watch in the movie. But yeah, thanks for coming on and, and sharing the story. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 71. And uh, please leave a rating and a review if you get a chance. I'd love to share it on the episode here. And uh, and also share this episode with uh, one other person if you get a chance. That'd be great. Um, easy way to do that is just to uh, hit one of the social share buttons or copy the URL. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to maybe see you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.